Shabbat Shalom, internet. Um, usually it's you, me, and a creek. Not so much today. Um, we have no creeks today, but there's about a dozen and a half people here. And um, we're on a mission in Florida, and it's Shabbat. And if that kind of rubs your fur backwards, go read uh, Matthew 12, 12. Okay, cool. Um, we are in Leviticus 11 this morning, which is the dietary law. There are no coincidences. That's not how the Father works. So, of course, what are we going to talk about while we're here? Dietary law. Because, like, this is a cornerstone of the way that I believe. As, um, I believe the whole Bible. I think most of you guys know that because, for whatever reason, you follow me on YouTube. So, you probably have a pretty good idea what I believe. Maybe not so much why. So, we're going to delve into some of the why this morning in Leviticus 11. Um, Leviticus 11 basically creates from a completely practical standpoint cul-de-sacs for uh, biological disturbances in your life, right? And so there's an argument between, well, you know, all that law was nailed to the cross and done away with. I don't believe that. Um, and well, you know, you don't have to do that anymore. I don't believe that. Well, you know, all things are good. Well, we're actually going to look at that this morning and the context around that statement and the fact that they added in parentheses in the King Jimmy and thus Yeshua declared all foods clean. If you go back and read the rest of the context, it's not, they're not talking about meat at all. But anyway, good morning over there. <laughs> I didn't recognize you over there. <laughs> um, so we're going to look at all that this morning and I'm going to try and do it in such a way as I always do, that we're talking eye to eye, not me above you or vice versa, because I'm not an authority in any of this. I just have a bone deep conviction to read this word with y'all and with y'all. So um, to the best of my ability, that's what we're going to do. So before we start in Leviticus 11, and I don't do a lot of flipping around, generally speaking, but because of the nature of this subject, we're gonna do a little bit of bouncing around so we can hear from the mouth of Messiah himself regarding this. Not just Old Testament, the uh, law handed down from Yah to Moshe, but reinforced by Messiah, who he himself said, hey, talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he's like, you guys don't know me because you don't know Moshe. If you knew who Moshe was, you'd know who I am. So slow your roll. You may, you're making it too hard with all your laws of man to keep my father's commandments. That was the problem that he took with the law was the human burden of all the extra rules, regulations, so forth that made it too difficult. You know, you were constantly sinning regardless of what you were doing. So flip over to Matthew 517 first. Por favor. And... I have this bracketed in my book. This is, uh, it's got a star next to it because it's fundamental. This is firmly embedded in the Sermon on the Mount, the most famous sermon that Messiah ever gave. It is doctrinal thesis to New Testament Christianity. However, it is consistently avoided, Matthew 5:17. Do not think that I came to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to complete. We're going to come back to that word. For truly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one yod or one tittle shall by no means pass from the Torah till all be done. Okay, well let's work backwards. All is not done. We are still here. We are doing works this weekend to put a smile on the Father's face. So all is not done. We go backwards. Okay. So by no means pass away. So nothing, we're still doing this. Heaven and earth. Is earth still here? Yes? Okay. Is heaven still here? I can only assume, I've not been there yet that I know of. I can only assume it's still there. Okay. Do not think that I came to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but complete. That word can also be rendered as fulfill. That word, which I've talked about repeatedly, is plerau. It's the Greek word plerau. And that means not complete like, close the book, I'm done with it. It means to literally embody. Plerau means to embody. So I didn't come to do away with this law. I came to embody 
this law for you to show you how to do this thing. So the way that I came to Torah in the first place was I was so PO'd at the Christian church and the doctrines and dogmas of man. And I was, I was completely distrustful of any other man telling me how to live my life to be a good Christian because I was surrounded by men who were trying to be good Christians, which were really just being really nice guys, but not doing what the word said to do. And it was a detriment to the group of believers that I was in because we weren't actually doing the things that the Father or Messiah tells us to do. And so I just started reading this word for myself. And the more I read this word for myself, the more it made sense that, hey, we're supposed to do these things. And if I'm gonna be a Christian, I should start first with trying to be like my Messiah. He's the example. And so it literally tells us here in Matthew 5, 17, look, I came to embody this law for you to show you how to do it. So bearing all that in mind, go back to Leviticus 11, please. <clears throat> I'm gonna adjust my tone. I feel like I'm being confrontational, I'm sorry. Sorry, internet. Like, What's wrong with you, T? I don't know. It's early, coffee. Scott's here looking at me. There's gnats building a colony in my eyes. You know, it's a good time. <clears throat> All right. So in Leviticus 11, and this is another thing too. You know, we don't have to keep that law anymore. Where does this come from? And Yahweh spoke to Moshe. And God spoke to Moses. It didn't come from Jim at the corner store. Hey, I think this is a good idea. This comes directly from the mouth of the Most High. Okay. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe and to Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the children of Israel. That's us. I've discussed that repeatedly. The children of Israel is us. We, <laughs> Our claim, our belief in Messiah is predicated on his lineage through Israel. Because as a condition, a fulfillment of him being the Messiah is his bloodline. It is Israel. The beginning, uh, the opening of Matthew is the genealogy of Yeshua, and it directly ties him back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is critical to the fulfillment of prophecy for Yeshua to be Messiah. So if we believe in him, he is part of Israel. We are therefore grafted into the tree of life. We are Israel, okay? So the children of Israel is us. So the father spoke to Moshe for us. Okay. Speak to the children of Israel, saying, These are the living creatures which you do not eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. Whatever has that you do eat. Sorry, Internet. These are the living creatures that you do eat. Next time somebody throws something at me, if I have that egregious of an error. Okay, I'm looking at you. Just that water bottle. Okay. These are the living creatures which you do eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. Whatever has a split hoof completely divided, chewing the cud among the beasts that you do eat. Ruminants, four-chambered stomachs. And this is, you know, going to be your deer, your sheep, your goats, your cattle, a handful of other things. <coughs> Only these you do not eat among those that chew the cud or those that have a split hoof. The camel, because it chews the cud but does not have a split hoof, it is unclean to you. And the rabbit because it chews the cud and does not have a split hoof and is unclean to you. And the hare, because it chews the cud but does not have a split hoof, it is unclean to you. We had meat rabbits, because you know, we're crazy tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist preppers. And um, they're delicious. They're tasty and they're easy and they're clean and well, not biblically clean, but they're physically clean. And uh, we don't have rabbits anymore. My wife killed most of them. <laughs> uh, we had to have bunny jihad. So I've talked about that at, at other times. We got the conviction to start keeping the dietary laws and then the father being, being him doing what he does, our rabbits broke out of their uh, rabbit colony that they were in and decimated our garden. So we were pissed. And so my wife was like, let's go to work and just started killing rabbits. <laughs> so we don't have rabbits anymore. Um, and because of Leviticus 11, and in fact, I've gotten emails from people that said, hey, we want to keep the Levitical dietary laws. Can we eat rabbit? It's literally right there 
don't eat the rabbit. So if your question is, I want to keep Levitical law, but should I eat rabbits? No. Leviticus 11, 5, and 6, don't eat rabbits. Okay, moving on. And the pig, though it has a split hoof completely divided, yet does not chew the cud, it is unclean to you. That is the major point of contention for most people. That is the deal breaker in Leviticus 11. When I told my wife I was going to start keeping the dietary laws and keeping Torah, she literally was like, no sausage? We can't eat sausage anymore? I said, no, baby, we, I'm not going to do it. And you were mad. You're like, no sausage biscuits? No bacon? What are we going to what, what are we gonna do? <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and we didn't eat. And so I did it. I was like, that's it. I'm not doing it. And in our house, my wife was respectful. She, you know, no pork, no nothing. She'd go get a burger with grandma or something. She'd get a bacon cheeseburger and kind of have that guilty look when she came home. But eventually she got on board. And then after about six months, we were having one of those moments. We were, we were new to this walk in Torah. And um, she looked at me and she said, you know what would be good? What? You should make some pulled pork. And I was like, hell yeah, I should make some pulled pork. Because I make some awesome pulled pork. So I made some pulled pork. The same way I've always made it. Every time I made it the same way, the same process. We ate some and every single person in my house was sick the entire weekend. We spent three days coming out of both ends. Okay, threw that out. Repented. Sorry, y'all. My bad. Don't test the Lord your God. Roger that. Got it. Won't do that again. And that, that kind of cemented it for us. And so again... Leviticus 11 removes these parasitical cul-de-sacs from your diet. And so there's an argument that's made back in the day, the Hebrews, as they were wandering through the wilderness, they needed this because they would have got sick otherwise. Just like we're going to get into Leviticus 12, hopefully, depending on how much I shut up and just read the word. Um, but all of this is about cleanliness, sanitation, so forth, so on. And so a lot of people will make the argument, you don't have to do that anymore because you're not wandering in the wilderness. Okay, well, number one, the father spoke to Moshe for my instruction. So I believe that I do still need to do it. Number two, just look at the situation we are in this morning, this weekend, right? No matter how hard we try, we're gonna be a little less sanitary this weekend than we would normally be. It would actually be a very practical thing to do these Levitical laws because we have a reduced incidence of contamination. Makes sense? And I think we're going back to times that are gonna be more like this, what we're experiencing right now, than our normal everyday, sitting on the couch in the living room, in the air conditioning, watching TV, looking at your iPhone, eating Cheetos, right? Or whatever. This gnat needs to die. Just saying. Don't laugh at me, Jay Johns. Thank you. Let's, yeah, this has deet in it. Unlike this stuff, this stuff is cute. It's natural. This stuff is poison. <laughs> there we go. All right. So their flesh, this is 11.8. Uh, their flesh you do not eat and their carcasses you do not touch. They are unclean to you. These you do not eat of all that are in the waters. Anyone that has fins and scales, these you do eat. Water bottle to the face. Anyone that has fins and scales in the waters, in the seas or the rivers that you do eat. So if it's got fins and scales, good to go. Okay. But all that have not fins and scales in the seas and in the rivers, all that move in the waters or any living being which is in the waters, they are an abomination to you. They are an abomination to you. Of their flesh you do not eat and their carcasses you abominate. You will have nothing to do them. Again, if you look at just the the hierarchy of where these things, if you look at the ecosystem of things that live in water, those that don't have fins and scales, they're the bottom feeders, okay? They're the, the collection mechanism in that ecosystem for all the parasites in that ecosystem. Something that Brother Alex and I were talking about yesterday, question mark, was, you know, the difference between good and expedient. Can I pray over a slab of pork and eat it? Sure. And it could be good because I prayed over it. Sure, is it expedient? The comparison I make is I can go into the furnace in your house and pull out the air filter and pray over it and lick it. And I can have faith that the Father is going to keep me from getting sick if I pray over it. 
but that doesn't make it freaking expedient. This is the thing that collects all the, all the crap in your house, right? Probably shouldn't eat it. Well, these things that are um, restricted from our diet in Leviticus 11 are the air filters of their particular ecosystems. They're collecting all the crap. We don't need them. We don't need that crap in us. So, and uh, we're actually, like I said, we are gonna jump over to Mark here in a little bit and talk about what goes into the mouth versus what comes out of the mouth that defiles somebody in the context around that. <clears throat> All right. And these you do abominate among the birds. They are not eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle, the vulture, and the black vulture, and the hawk and the falcon after its kind. Every raven after its kind, and the ostrich, and the night hawk, and the seagull, and the hawk. I just got a visual of us trying to chase down an ostrich and eat it, so I'm going <laughs> to... It's end times, man. Nicole's got a freaking sword on her hip. <laughs> ah! <laughs> All right, don't eat ostriches. <coughs> Stop it, Paige. Stop it, thing. Eggs as well. Um, that's a great question. I don't know. We should look that up. An ostrich egg versus the ostrich itself? I don't know. Uh, that's a really great question. Okay. And, uh, the seagull and the hawk after its kind, uh, the hawk and the falcon, every raven after its kind, the ostrich, the night hawk, and the seagull and the hawk after its kind, and the little owl and the fisher owl and the great owl and the white owl and the pelican and the carrion vulture. That one I definitely get. I have never looked at a buzzard and thought, man, got to eat that. That looks delicious. You know, hook it up, man. Barbecue sauce. That'd probably be a new MRE, you know, buzzard with barbecue sauce. <laughs> buzzard with I want a picture of your face. That's priceless. As All right. Long, as long as it's better than the veggie egg omelet. Man. Yeah, maybe, probably. Hot sauce. Um, only these you do eat of every flying insect. I missed a whole part of it. The stork, the heron after its kind, and the my translation says the hoopoe and the bat. Who's got a word other than hoopoe? You got, are we all reading out of the scriptures? Dang it. That's what happens when you tell people to buy the scriptures. You don't, we don't have any opposing opinions here. Black goose-like goose -like bird. I like that. What version do you have? The what study? Ryrie study Bible. Cool. Um, all right. Don't eat black goose-like birds. Thank you, brother. <laughs> hey, look, a black goose-like bird. You can't eat it. Uh, <laughs> I think if it's black and it looks like a goose and it's a bird, don't eat it. <laughs> That's that. That would be that. Well, geese have long necks, so. Uh, well, let's see here. The stork and the heron. You know, geese, like Canada geese, they get worms in there, and they're not great eating. Um, yeah. Like a flying carp. Thank you. Yes. No bueno. Like a Canada geese are like flying carp. Thank you. <laughs> Memorialized for eternity on the internet. All right. <coughs> okay. The stork and the heron and the hoopoe or black geese-like bird object and the bat. All flying insects that creep on all fours is an abomination to you. Only these you do eat of every flying insect that creeps on all fours. Those which have jointed legs above their feet with which to leap on the earth. Who remembers what John the Baptist's diet was? And locusts. Amen. I've thought about that and be like, man, you got to be hardcore. It's like, what do you have for breakfast? Honey and locusts. Cool. What's for dinner? Honey and locusts. How about tomorrow? Honey and locusts. <laughs> Forever. <laughs> Honey and locusts. Like, uh, all right. Yeah. 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 There's loads of them down here right now. Are you okay? You all right? Yeah. Okay. What happened? The sidewalk? The sidewalk? Oh, the oh, my wife holding my youngest child just uh, butt planted backwards out of a chair. You okay? <laughs> and now Aspen won't let go of Harmony. Thank you. 
Ma, I'm trying to talk to the internet. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, the interruptions. I'm glad that nobody has decided to start crowing like a rooster was, during this conversation. This <laughs> I've talked about shooting the rooster. Just, just be careful. Um, yeah. All right. Locusts, worms. This is what we were talking about. Uh, all of them you do not eat. I have the Arbe locust after its kind, the Solam locust after its kind, the Hargol locust after its kind, and the Chagab locust after its kind. But all other flying insects which have four feet are an abomination to you. And by these you are made unclean. Anyone touching the carcass of any of them is unclean until evening. And anyone picking up part of the carcass of any of them has to wash his garments and shall be unclean until evening. Now, it's important that we understand clean versus unclean and defilement, right? Because like I said, we're going to Mark 7, okay? We're talking about here, what do you consume? What do you not consume? This is what you eat, right? And so that's literally how Leviticus 11 starts. Yah talks to Moshe and he's like, this is what you guys eat. What you think about, if we all got relocated from where we live to say here, and we weren't from this area, because that's what happened, right? Most of us are not from this area. But the father, the most high, showed up and was like, Hey guys, great to see you. Thanks for doing my things. By the way, little introductory course. This is what you eat. This is what you don't eat. Cool, because I don't know. Hey, look, a giant lizard thing up in a tree. Can we eat that? No, don't eat it. It's not good for you. Roger that, right? Eat that thing over there. Okay, cool, right? And so that's what's going on here. Remember, they're in the wilderness, right? They're doing these things. This is what you eat. This is what you don't eat. They did not come from this place. They just are in this place. So it is literal instruction from the Most High how to conduct themselves in such a way that it's going to go well for them. That's the Torah. These are how you do the things so it will go well for you. It's the instruction of, okay? So... However, clean versus unclean, we talk about ritual purity. Because earlier in Leviticus, we have, we talked the last time we were here, the boss is tall, building the temple, right? Okay, so they build the tent of a point in the tabernacle. The whole back end of Exodus is make this thing out of gold and make the poles out of acacia wood and all the sockets of silver and this many cubits and blah, 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 and over and over and over. They do all that. Then the beginning of Leviticus is, all right, you built the things, this is how you do the things. All right, so then they get the instruction for Aaron and the priesthood and the ordination of Aaron, which remember, this is a key point. Aaron has an ordination, had an ordination from the Most High. He was chosen, right, to be the leader of the Levitical priests. He was also the guy when Moshe went up on the mountain, Moshe comes back and he's like, what are you doing? Oh, I don't know. We built a fire and threw some gold in and this false idol just popped out. Okay, same guy. And so that always makes me very mindful of the fact that our priests and our pastors, even though they had the best of intentions, Aaron made that false idol so that the people would have something to worship. He did it in service to the people that he was leading. Okay, so his heart was in the right place, allegedly, even though he was the first commandment we get is, do you have no God but God, right? Okay, by the way, here's a golden idol. It's hard to, you know... Yeah. Yeah, hard to justify one versus the other. But um, Aaron was trying to do the right thing and still totally messed up. And he is the father of the Levitical priesthood, right? With an ordination from the creator of the universe. So it just proves the point that men will fail, okay? And that's why I don't farm out my relationship with the creator to any other man. I just read his word and I pray for direction because somebody with the best of intentions as a pastor or a priest or, or a rabbi or anybody is going to make mistakes, right? And so we have the ordination of, and so now we finally get to this thing and we're talking almost in the context of ritual purity. This is how you conduct yourself inside the tabernacle. That's where it talks about you should be clean until evening. Okay, this is a ritual purity issue, and that's important when we get to Mark. Okay. 24, and by these you're made unclean. Anyone touching the carcass is unclean, yada, yada, yada. Anyone who touches the carcass is unclean. And then 27, 
and whatever goes on its paws among all the creatures that go on all fours, those are unclean to you. Anybody here ever eat a fried squirrel? Yeah, it's a shame that they're unclean. <laughs> you do them right, a little buttermilk, baste them in flour, and psh, hot grease, yeah, salt, pepper, they're delicious. Anyway, I mean, I don't know, internet. Good morning, good to see you. Uh, all right, if it has paws, we don't eat it. Anyone who touches it is unclean until evening. And he who picks up the carcass has to wash his garments and she'll be made unclean until evening. They are unclean to you. Ritual purity and practicality. You touch a carcass, hey, you probably shouldn't go cook dinner for the 40 or 50 of us, okay? You were just handling a dead body, now you're gonna go cook dinner. That's probably not gonna go well for the rest of us, okay? So you're unclean until evening. Don't touch that stuff, okay? I've done a lot of this stuff is practicality. I've talked about that repeatedly. People are like, well, you know, brother, it takes the proper understanding of the word. You have to properly divide the word. The name of the book is literally the first three words in each book. Bereshit literally means in the beginning, right? And Shemot, Exodus, literally means these are the names, which are the first words in the beginning. Of, it literally, like, that's how practical it is. There's like, hardly any room for error. In it's that. very practical. And so we need to be careful. It doesn't mean that we can only read it on this level. So you, there's multiple levels that you can read scripture. And there's a rabbinical teaching that there are 70 different ways to teach the Torah. Meaning that if you started teaching Torah at 30, you would be 100 years old by the time you had sussed out all the different facets of the Torah. And it, there's a Torah portion ascribed to, uh, I think there's 46 to 50 different Torah portions over the course of a year. Then they allow for the readings for the feasts. But basically... A priest or a rabbi would read this same portion on the same week every year. But the teaching there is over the course of 70 years, you might get all you might be able to squeeze all the juice out of that one portion. It would take 70 years. And so there's many different levels you can read it on, but definitely you can read it on the practical level and go, aha, yeah, that would be a, a good idea to not cook food or be in the camp after handling dead bodies that could be carrying parasites, right? Let alone to put that body in you that could be carrying parasites. Okay. Um, yada, yada, yada. These are unclean among the creeping creatures, those that creep on the earth, the mole and the mouse and the tortoise after its kind. Anybody here ever try and butcher a turtle? No. No, yeah? Uh, yeah, it's brutal. <laughs> I had to dissect one for a uh, college biology class that I took in the seventh grade and they paired me up with some uh, beta male. And uh, oh. we ended up using a K-bar and a framing hammer, and he was appalled. <laughs> he was, what are you doing? I was like, we gotta get this shell open. He had like a little number 10 scalpel and some forceps. I was like, bro, that ain't gonna work. <laughs> Batoning a K-bar through a turtle. This kid was appalled. Um, you know? <laughs> Yeah, he was appalled. Uh, and the gecko and the land crocodile and the sand reptile and the sand lizard and the chameleon. These are unclean to you among all that creep. Anyone who touches them when they are dead becomes unclean until the evening. And whatever any of them in its dead state falls upon becomes unclean, whether it's any wooden object or garment or skin or sack or any object in which work is done, it is put in water and it shall be unclean until evening, then it shall be clean. We'll just say you, whatever object, you got a wooden cutting board and a dead chameleon lands on it. Probably not a good idea to keep fixing dinner on that cutting board, okay? Makes sense? Yeah. Is everybody tracking? Like, highly logical, all right? Practical. Okay, and this again, with, well, you know, we have to properly divide the word. It's right there in black and white. Like, there's no properly dividing that. It's very straightforward. And, in, and again, even the words of Messiah, as we're going to see, are very straightforward. All right. <clears throat> okay. Yada, yada, yada. Any earthen vessel into which any of them falls, like, you know, if we had a, a clay pot, that becomes unclean. We break it so that we don't use it again. Any of the food, because clay's porous. Something to think about, okay? Um, 
Any of the food which might be eaten on which water comes becomes unclean, and any drink which might be drunk from it becomes unclean. If I drop a cube of pork into the water that you're drinking, do you want to drink, drink it now? No, it's unclean. Okay. And whatever any of their carcasses falls on becomes unclean. An oven or a cooking range, it is broken down. They are unclean and are unclean to you. But a fountain or a well, a collection of water, is clean. But whatever touches their carcass is unclean. And when any of their carcasses falls on any planting seed, which is to be sown, it is clean. Okay, if you had a sack of grain and a dead mouse falls in it, you don't chuck the grain. Pull the dead mouse out of it, sow the seed. Okay, which I'm from New York originally. I have a lot of experience with New York Jews. I don't know if anybody else does. We are in Florida, so there's a lot of them here as well. And I hear in my mind, well, what happens if a mouse falls in the grain? Then what do we do, Moshe? You know, like I hear this internal dialogue of this New York Jewish voice, like, well, then what do we do? It's like, this is what we do, you know? And so I wonder how many of these stipulations are uh, to counteract the griping of the Hebrews, you know? Yeah. Well, now what do we do? Well, what about this? Well, what about this? Yeah, like, shut up. <laughs> do, these, do these things, you know, quit griping. You know, these are the same people. It's like, you brought us out of slavery into the desert to die. It's like, bro, you came willingly, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> um, what up, child? Okay. Blah, blah, blah. But when any water is put on the seed and any part of it, any part of any carcass falls on it, it is unclean to you. And when any of the beasts which are yours for food dies, Okay, so we have a beast, it's for food, it dies. He who touches its carcass becomes unclean until evening. So if you've been butchering or you have a dead animal, unclean until evening. And he who eats of its carcass has to wash his garments and she'll be unclean until evening. Common sense. You can't keep that law. No man can keep that law. Bro, it's pretty, it's pretty easy. Okay, and I'm just saying because I've spent a lifetime in the Christian church, like, it's impossible to keep that law. No, it's not. Well, only one man was ever righteous, brother. No, read your Bible. I can find you a dozen examples just in Genesis of men that were righteous. Righteous simply means doing what the Father tells you to do. Right now, does that mean that Yeshua wasn't righteous? No, absolutely. He is the ultimate authority on righteousness. Okay? But it doesn't mean that we can't aspire to that. And it was when I started reading Genesis and realized at the end of Genesis 6, the beginning of Genesis 7, that righteousness is ascribed to Noah because he did what the father told him to do, that I started realizing, okay, there's a chance for me, I can probably do these things too. I can attempt to live like my Messiah, right? Righteousness is doing what the father tells you to do. And so there's this propaganda in the modern Christian church that we just can't live up to we can't live up to that standard that's why we have a messiah that's perfection and then us. correct now exactly there's perfection and then there's us there's and Jesus and then us. right and the gap in between us and perfection is what's closed by the atoning sacrifice of messiah because yeah I can't keep this word and this law perfectly I'm not capable of that but I have an intercessor. I, Hebrews 8, 6, 8, 8, 8, 10, we've talked about that repeatedly here. There is a mediator of a renewed covenant for me that's going to cover that gap in between where I'm at and what perfection is, right? And so, but it doesn't mean we don't try. But, I mean, but even Noah and Moses and all, Moses and all of them, they, they, they still weren't. Jesus. They weren't no, perfect. they're not even close. You know they were. So there's righteousness and then there's Jesus. That's, that's the yes. Ultimate. There's righteousness and then there's Messiah. And so that's exactly right. But it doesn't mean that we don't try and do the things. Well, yeah. And in fact, we're told repeatedly, do the things. If you love me, keep my commandments. Okay? It's about obedience. It's about obedience. That's exactly right. And because then when you commit yourself to obedience, the grace is no longer cheap because you understand where you're falling short. Not just, well, sin is falling short of the mark, brother. What mark? Well, you know, no, I don't, show me. Where is it? Well, you know, all right, this conversation's over. If you can show me in the book what mark it is I'm falling short of, I'm happy to have that conversation with you. But if you have this amorphous impression of sin is just anything that makes you feel bad, I disagree. 
Sin is 1 John 3, 4, transgression of the law. That's what sin is. What's the law? We're reading it. So when you know where the boundaries are, you know when you're getting outside of them, you know when you've sinned, right? It doesn't mean you don't try, right? Even Paul said, shall we sin all the more so that grace may abound? No, God forbid, right? Sin is transgression of the law. Should we break the law even more so that the grace of Messiah may abound? No, God forbid. So, all right, shut up, T, read the Bible, roger that. All right, dying and the things with the things, unclean until morning, uh, and every swarming creature, <laughs> swarming, the one that swarms on the earth is an abomination and is not eaten, and whatever crawls on its stomach and whatever goes on all fours and whatever has many feet, like a centipede or a millipede, among all swarming creatures, the ones swarming on earth, these you do not eat, for they are an abomination. You do not make yourselves abominable with any swarming creature, the one swarming. Don't eat swarming things. And swarming sounds like a really re weird word when you say it a half a dozen times in a row. Swarming. Don't eat yeah. yeah, don't eat the bees. But you can have the honey. So you can have the honey. The question, yeah, that's correct. I th that answers the ostrich question. I think you can eat the eggs but maybe not the ostrich itself. Okay, don't eat swarming things. The ones swarming on the earth you do not eat, for they are an abomination. And do not make yourselves abominable with any swarming creature. The ones swarming do not make yourselves unclean with them, lest you be defiled by them. Again, ritual purity, defilement. Okay. For I am Yahweh, your Elohim. Those are just old laws. For I am Yahweh, your Elohim. You shall set yourselves apart. What does set apart mean? Anybody remember? Show of hands. How's it rendered in the King James? Holy. Yeah, set, to, make, to, to be made holy. Holy means sanctified. Sanctified means set apart. So in order for something to be holy, it's literally set apart from. That's why remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Literally means to set that day apart from the rest of the week and be mindful that day, especially mindful that day of your relationship with the Most High, to read His Word, seek His face, so forth and so on, right? To keep it holy means to keep it separate from, right? The Holy of Holies in the Tabernacle, the Tent of Appointment, is the farthest thing away from everything else. It's the most set apart. It, and it's literally, in this translation, referred to as the most set apart place. Literal, okay? So, Okay, for I am Yahweh who is bringing you up, I'm sorry, for I am Yahweh, your Elohim, and you shall set yourselves apart, and you shall be set apart, for I am set apart. And do not defile yourselves with any swarming creature, the one creeping on the earth. I don't know why he hits swarming so hard here, but apparently, guys, don't mess around with swarming creatures, okay? Okay, cool. Don't do this. That's that, that's that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Foot stomp, knife hand, no swarming. Roger that, got it. For I am Yahweh who is bringing you up out of the land of Mitzrayim to be your Elohim, to be your God. And you shall be set apart, for I am set apart. This is the Torah, the instruction of the beasts and the birds and every living being, the creeping creature in the waters and every being that swarms on the earth, to make a distinction between the unclean and the clean, between the living creature that is eaten and the living creature that is not eaten. Okay, in that last paragraph, 47, to make a distinction between the unclean and the clean, and between the living creature that is eaten and the living creature that is not eaten. What do we eat? And ritual purity, okay? Remember, literally a chapter ago, Aaron gets his ordination. I don't know if you guys have read Leviticus 9.10 yet, but... Uh, Aaron gets an ordination, they start doing the things, and two of his four sons are drunk. And they mess up, and they put fire in their censers, and it's the wrong fire with the wrong incense in service to the Most High, and the father, boom, smotes them. Done. And Moshe and Aaron are like, WTF, bro. And Yahweh is like, uh-uh, you do my things my way right? You do my things my way. And so that has a lot to do with the ritual purity aspect of this is how you behave in service to me. I literally have a note in here uh, in Exodus 10. If you, you could just flip back and look at it. Um, 
Exodus 10, 9. Do not drink wine or strong drink, you nor your sons with you, when you go into the tent of appointment, lest you die, a law forever throughout your generations. Then I have no drunkenness in service to Yahweh, written in the margins. That... That's, yeah. Yeah. Keep, keep this sharp when you're thinking about that. That's exactly right. And so... What we have here in 11 is a continuation of these are how you do the things and the idea between clean and unclean, ritual purity, how to conduct yourselves appropriately to be in service to the Father and the practical tactical of don't eat these things because it's going to make you sick. And so in 1147, it addresses both of those things, the clean versus unclean and what do you eat, what don't you eat. All right. And then, all right, we're only 40 minutes in. We got a few more minutes. Good. Let's go, um, you can flip over to Mark 7, por favor, that would be in the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament. I'm sorry, internet, usually I talk to you guys, but there's real people here this time, so. Not that you're not real people, please don't get offended, but you know what I mean. Hi, Marlo. Mark 7. Mark 7. Okay. And... Sha ba da ba da. La 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 la. All right, and then just briefly, I'm gonna read from John 14:10. Okay, and I have all the issues with people who just cherry pick verses, and I've talked about this repeatedly. Let's take three unrelated verses, string them together, talk about them for 20 minutes, 35 minutes, call it a sermon. Y'all have a nice day. The Cowboys are playing at noon. I'm out. Right. Uh, but without going into the context, John 14, 10, do you not believe that, and this is Messiah talking, that I am in the father and the father is in me. The words that I speak to you, I do not speak from myself, but the father who stays in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the father and the father is in me. Otherwise believe me because of the works themselves. Okay. Yeshua and the Father. I and my Father are one. These are not my instructions. These are from the Father. Okay. With that in mind, go to Mark 7. And we have, this is one of those passages that says, oh, well, we're done with that. We don't have to keep that dietary law anymore because Messiah said, all right, yeah, if you look at just the one verse, you can certainly come up with that argument. But we're not going to look at just that one verse. Uh, I'm going to read almost all of it. So, seven, and the Pharisees and some of the scribes assembled to him, Yeshua, having come from Jerusalem, and I have this underlined and a star next to it, and seeing some of his taught ones, his disciples, eating, taught ones, eat bread with defiled, that is, unwashed hands, they found fault. Okay, remember, the Pharisees and the Sadducees that continuously added to the law made it harder and harder and harder. There were 39 different categories of defilement in place in their legalistic system at the time. Um, you could not spit on the Sabbath because the Pharisees said that when your spit hit the ground, it would divot the ground and that would be winnowing, which is part of planting and harvesting. Okay, so this is literally what Messiah is railing against. He's like, you den of vipers, you have turned my father's beautiful law into this thing that's impossible to keep. And this is when you hear Messiah and Paul and anybody else railing against the law. It's the law of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It's not the perfect law from the Most High that's given for our teaching and instruction that we just saw in Leviticus 11. Leviticus 11 is bookended with, I am Yahweh, your Elohim. Where did this come from? I am Yahweh, your Elohim. Not, I am Pharisees, I am Sadducees, I am legalistic BS, I am Yahweh, your Elohim. And so this is what Yeshua took issue with, and obviously his disciples as well, because they were traveling around with the guy, right? They were doing the things with him. All right. For the Pharisees and all of the Yehudim, the Jews, do not eat unless they wash their hands thoroughly, holding fast to the tradition of the elders. Okay. Today... Jews participate in ritual hand-washing before they eat, not to cleanse their hands, 
because it is a ritual. It is a literal practice of man. Okay. And coming from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions which they have received and hold fast, the washing of cups and utensils and copper vessels and couches. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Yeshua, why do your taught ones not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? What is this passage about? Washing hands. Washing hands. Just remember, we're talking about washing your hands when we get to where we're going. Twice here, in what amounts to three inches worth of page, we've talked about washing hands. <clears throat> and having answered, and he answering, Yeshua answering, said to them, Well, did Yeshiyahu, Isaiah, prophesy, well did Isaiah prophesy concerning you hypocrites, as it has been written, this people respect me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they do worship me, teaching as teaching the commands of men. Oh, Pff, zinger, right? Gut shot. I love that. That's a verbal throat punch. It's like, yeah, all right? These are your things, not the Father's things. The teachings of men, yeah. Forsaking the commands of Elohim, you hold fast to the traditions of men. This is why I am not in the Christian church. The end. You hold fast to the traditions of men. And he, Messiah, said to them, Well do you set aside the command of Elohim in order to guard your traditions. You don't do the Father's things, you do your things. For Moshe said, Who? Moshe. What did we just read? Moshe. A conversation between Moshe and the Most High. For Moshe said, respect your father and your mother. Well, and remember, the New Testament has nothing to do with the Old Testament, okay? According to the Christian church, they're two separate books. Old Testament's for the Jews, New Testament's for the Christians, which is ridiculous because the Old Testament is this thick and the New Testament is this thick. And every time you see in the word where it refers to the scriptures, it's talking about the Old Testament because the New Testament was a series of letters that were being passed around at the time. They were not canonized into what we consider the Bible now in context then. So it's a travesty that there's this perception that these two, the Old Testament and the New Testament are not connected. Uh, it's again, grace without obedience. Grace without obedience is cheap and it pisses people off when I say that and I don't care because it is, it's cheap. And it's a conviction of the heart to do these things in obedience to the Most High. All right. For Moshe said, respect your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. He's saying this is the basis for your argument for your traditions here, Pharisees. But you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me, it is korban, or that is a gift. You no longer let him do any matter at all for his father or his mother, nullifying the word of Elohim through your tradition, which you have handed down. And many such traditions you do. Nullifying the word of Elohim through your tradition, which you have handed down, and many such traditions you do. And calling the crowd to him, to Yeshua, he said to them, Hear me everyone and understand there is no matter that enters a man from outside which is able to defile him but it is what comes out of him that defiles him ritual purity defilement washing of hands bear that in mind if anyone has ears to hear let him hear and understand that the pharisees were holding a monopoly over the temple and the belief structure in general at this time so what he's saying is Listen, these guys don't get to tell you that you're defiled and unclean because you won't keep their laws and traditions of men. Okay? That's extremely important to understand the context there. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he went from the crowd into a house and, taught, and his taught ones, his disciples, asked him concerning the parable. And he said to them, and I just got to point out, these guys walked with him every day for years, and they still needed further instruction on the side. Bear that in mind, I always do, 
bear that in mind when reading the Gospels. It's not that there isn't power and truth and authority in the Gospels and the epistles, because there are. But I am words of Messiah first and foremost, and then words of man, even if they were apostles. Because oftentimes, Messiah has to pull them aside, smack them on the back of the head and go, no, this is what I was talking about. And so be careful how much authority you ascribe to the words of Paul over the words of Messiah. Okay. And he said to them, are you also without understanding? Do I need to smack you on the back of the head? Do you not perceive what, that whatever enters a man from outside is unable to defile him? Because it does not enter his heart but his stomach and is eliminated, thus purging all the foods. And he said, what comes out of a man, it is what comes out of a man that defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil reasonings, adulteries, whorings, murders, thefts, greedy desires, wickedness, deceit, indecency, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. All these wicked matters come from within and defile a man. Defile means to make dirty or lose purity. Okay. This is a conversation about eating bread in a marketplace with dirty hands. This is not a conversation about what is clean versus unclean food. This is a conversation about ritual purity and Messiah and his apostles railing against the BS authority of the Pharisees and the Sadducees that they held over the people at that time, complicating their relationship between them and the Most High. This does not mean that it's okay to go ahead and eat all the things that we just talked about. It's about ritual purity. And what he's talking about, that it goes into your stomach, not your heart. He's saying if you eat a piece of bread with dirty hands, your digestive system is going to deal with that and you'll be okay. But we know what food is. We just talked about what food is. This is not a conversation about what food is or isn't. It's a conversation about what happens if you eat food with dirty hands. Okay? Cool. And we can go on and read the rest from there, but we don't really have to because from there, basically, he bounces out and, and he starts finding some more uh, disciples and then other things happen. But I wanted to make sure that we hit Mark 7 in context of Leviticus 11 because it's a common... I mean, it's a common rebuke from people who say, well, you know, you don't need to keep that because all food was declared clean by Messiah. Well, those parentheses were literally added in the King James and thus all food was declared clean. That's not what it says. We have clear instruction on what food is. This is a conversation about what happens to you if you eat food with dirty hands. They're two completely different things and don't let one inform the other. Wash your hands if you want to, but don't do it in a ritualistic way when you eat food. What's food? Right here, Leviticus 11. And so, you guys out there in the internet world, if anybody comes at you and makes this argument with you, now you have a leg to stand on. All of this is clear, and it's instruction from the Most High, from the Father to Moshe, for us, for Israel, which is us, which Yeshua then comes and says, Matthew 5, 17, listen, it's not my commands, it's the Father's commands. All authority in heaven and earth is vested in me. If you love me, keep my commands. What are they? We're reading them right now in Leviticus. And so typically I do two chapters and Leviticus 12 is short, but I'm not gonna. So we're just gonna camp on Leviticus 11 and, and we're done. Um, so yeah. That's Leviticus 11. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you guys for being here. I'm going to pray in a hot minute, but uh, I don't really want to pray on camera. I want to pray with these people here. So that's what we're going to do. But bless you guys at home. Shalom. Thank you for being here. And uh, if, uh, if anybody gives you a hard time about clean eating and brings up Mark 7, tell them it's about hand washing. Okay. Shalom.